Hey what's up everybody, it's Kellen here from Star Your Systems and welcome back to MXGP Pro where today we are going to be playing Lommel in Belgium as Arminas Chassaconis because the MXGP of Belgium just happened this past weekend in real life, the 2018 MXGP of Belgium and we're going to be talking about that today. We're going to discuss what happened, what went down, championship implications with that um, and all the funsies that go with it while playing, of course, the Belgian track in Lommel. Pretty kind of a legendary track at this point for uh, being one of the roughest sand tracks on planet Earth and just being just, I don't know, crazy. A track that those guys in Europe train on a lot. A lot of uh, riders live in Belgium. Um, for those American fans that don't know much about the GP scene, uh, Zach Osborne when he used to race the GPs, actually lived uh, in a town near Lommel and trained at Lommel a lot. So, gives you an idea of how often these guys are here um, because they all live within a good, reasonable distance of Lommel, whether they're British, French, Belgian, Dutch, um, even Italian, you're not terribly far from Belgium in many of those circumstances. So, uh, it's good training grounds for these guys. It gets super rough and crazy so it's kind of a home track for everybody it seems uh, but it's the most home track for of course Jeffrey Hurlings and if anybody thought Jeffrey Hurlings wasn't gonna go 1-1 this weekend um, it might be time to find a different sport because yeah this <laughs> Jeffrey Hurlings owns Lommel the one exception I would have to that is when he moved up to the 450 class, or technically he was on a 350 in the open class um, at the 2012 Motocross the Nations at Lommel, and he and Cairoli split moto victories. Um, Cairoli actually went 1-1 because he was in the MX-1 class, but uh, the, the class that they shared, which was the, you know, the third race, um, Cairoli actually beat him, but that was, you know, 2012, Hurlings um, was on his way to his, or actually just won his first MX2 world title that year. Um, but I don't know, he just wasn't the same guy that he is now. He's definitely more improved and overall pretty, a pretty well-rounded rider these days, but still just immensely talented in the sand. And, and he just, he dominated all weekend long at Lommel. He was doing a just crazy things. I mean, I urge you guys to just watch Hurlings ride in the sand. If if you do it for five seconds, you know, go to YouTube and Jeffrey Hurlings, Falcon Sward, Lommel, um, any track that you can find that's sand of him riding on it. It's incredible. Uh, it's honestly, it's like almost poetry in motion in some sense because the things that he's able to do to control the bike, to hit the things that he does, uh, it's incredible. Like, I, there's no real words for it because I don't know if I've ever seen anybody have that much control in that tricky of a condition um, that Hurlings does. And, and like I said, he just dominated. He didn't get a good start the second moto, actually. Um, he came out of the middle of the gate and got kind of pinched and then just kind of weaved through everybody and caught and passed his teammate Koldenhoff pretty quickly. I think even by the end of the first lap it was, if I remember correctly. And he was out of there. Um, See so ya. Yeah. In fact, in, in, even in the second moto, he crashed on the last lap and still got up and won by like 30 seconds. Um, that's how far gone he was. And, I mean, it's... You know, coming right in the middle of a pretty convincing MXGP title campaign at this point. I really hate to mention it, but I think the only thing that stops him at this point is getting hurt. And I really, really hope he doesn't get hurt. Um, championship aside, I am eager as a beaver to see him square off against Eli Tomac at the Motocross Nations this year. Which seems like it's going to happen. Um... You know, as long as Hurlings doesn't get hurt, of course he's going to go for the Netherlands team. I don't see why he wouldn't. Uh, he obviously loves coming and racing against the United States riders because he did it at Indiana last year. So I, I think that he's all in as long as he doesn't get hurt. And there's still some question marks about Tomac maybe not racing motocross the nations. Yes, he has said it, that he will do it. 
doesn't necessarily mean he will, but we're going to probably find out this weekend. They usually announce the USA team at Unadilla, so we'll find out. Hopefully, um, figure that all out. And I want to just briefly stop this whole discussion about the GP of Belgium and just just real quickly kind of point something out for any of you USA diehard fans in Motocross Nations. Uh, USA has not won the Motocross Nations since 2011 when it was in France. The next year they lost in Belgium on Lommel. Germany won. And they've had a pretty bad dry streak. Sure, they've had some bad luck. They've had some opportunities where they maybe could have won. Um, but I really do think that if they don't get this done on home soil this year, which I think they will, but if they don't, they're not winning next year. The reason they're not winning next year in 2019 is because the Motocross Nations is going to be at Assen in the Netherlands, which is a uh, MotoGP circuit that they build a sand track onto. And it's not as gnarly as Lommel, but it has the potential to get brutal, rough, gnarly, and I'm sorry, the, the USA riders are great riders. They are not what the Europeans are in the sand. It's just not even close. Um, I mean, we saw, you know, Dungey was near the top of his game. He had just won his title in 2012 when they went over to uh, Lommel. And you could tell in the second moto that Dungey raced back in 2012, which would have been the uh, third race, he was trying, man. He was pushing the envelope, and he crashed because he was pushing so hard, which Dungey didn't crash a lot. I mean, you have to go back and find very minute circumstances that Dungey hit the ground, and he crashed pushing too hard because he didn't have it. These guys were just walking around the Americans that day, and I feel like that's going to happen at Aston in 2019. So fingers crossed USA not only puts a good team on the track this year but actually wins it. Because I'd imagine if they don't, the Chamberlain Trophy is at least not coming back to the USA until 2020. Uh, I don't know where the donations are going to be yet. Nobody does, but I don't see them winning at Asset. So uh, that's just a, a little caveat there for you all. But back to the GP of Belgium discussion. It was just a, a complete hurlings day. Cairoli was just the second best guy all day. He didn't uh, get a good start in the second moto like hurlings. Um, but fought his way into second and just stayed there. He was, like I said, kind of head and shoulders above everybody else that wasn't named Jeffrey Hurlings, but Jeffrey Hurlings was, you know, giant head and shoulders above everybody else. He was gone. Um, and then Koldenhoff, who's had a pretty rough year, he actually went 6-3, uh, which was not good enough for third. A 4-4 four, four out of Geyser, I believe. Geyser Fevre, one of the two, went 4-4 four, four, uh, for third. And, um, yeah, I mean, that just kind of shows that the Dutch team is going to be unstoppable at Assen because Koldenhoff has had a pretty darn tough year, and he still is able to just moto down in the sand like it's his home race, even though it's not. It's in Belgium. Um, so, yeah. But uh, Koldenhoff looked good. Um, not too many surprises out of the MXGP class. The MX2 class... To me, at least, this year has kind of continuously provided new surprises here and there. Um, like, I know that these dudes are fast, um, but you kind of haven't seen much of, a, like, a Yago Geertz this year. Uh, he's been good on occasion, but he was a superstar, <clears throat> excuse me, this past weekend in Belgium. Um, he ended up going 6-2, uh, 7-2, two, two, I believe. So he didn't get on the podium, if I remember correctly, but uh, the second place in the second moto was really hard fought for Geertz. Um, had to work through the whole field and actually didn't get too far away from the eventual GP winner, Jorge Prado Garcia, who went 1-1. And Gar uh, Prado Garcia, whatever you want to call him, um, is looking pretty darn good for this championship. And while he is kind of making his own luck and riding really well, he's also been aided by the fact that Paul's Jonas is collapsing in the second half of the season. I don't know what has happened, but, you know, I talked about it in the last video I did, which was Lockett, where Jonas didn't look like the same rider. And he actually looked half decent, I feel like, in Belgium. And Jonas is a great rider. I've, I've seen him do some amazingly good things on a 250F before. And when I saw him get a good start, uh, 
in that first moto, I believe it was, I was like, oh, you know, here we go. He's, he's going to be, you know, frisky this time. He's going to take it to Prado. Maybe he wins this moto. And Prado got to him and passed him, like, kind of quickly. And then uh, Jonas kind of folded up into a shell of himself and then yard sailed out of second. Like, it was so weird. I, I don't know what's really happened to him. He's just seemed to kind of lose that edge that he had at the beginning of the year and then he's crashing a lot um, on top of it which is never a good thing because there's always the potential to get hurt with that but it also doesn't help his case when it comes to trying to gain as many points as possible because he keeps crashing out of these second or third place positions and in that first mode he crashed out of second and finished fourth um, which is you know just that many more points that doesn't help him towards the championship which he just lost the championship lead to Prado at the last GP in the Czech Republic so I don't really I, I don't have an answer for you for what's going on with Jonas but it's definitely helping Prado's case because you know while Prado's riding fantastic and deservedly is picking up race victories uh, his points lead is growing quicker than maybe it should be because Jonas has been crashing or having these you know weird off rides like it at locket he just kind of went backwards like got a decent start and was up front and just faded to seventh i think it was it's like what you know i don't i don't i don't get it you know where where did he go what happened to paul's jonas has anybody seen him <laughs> someone else is riding his bike i don't know what's happened um so yeah it, it's it's looking very uh very good for prado of course a 1-1 this weekend definitely helps his case um, behind him like I said is all mixed up Geertz was the next guy that kind of shined through we saw um, uh, Calvin Volander kind of shine through um, <clears throat> a couple races ago back in Indonesia and he's kind of been steadily at the front since and uh, Geertz has a breakthrough ride and he's kind of you know he's still pretty young um, he's going to be on the Belgium motocross the nations team this year and he's kind of being groomed into this next you know Belgian protege if you will um of course belgium has always had fantastic riders and you know of of recent they have de Saul killing it still in the mxgp class but you know they used to have the diker and um obviously they have van horbeek and uh kevin Strybos and stuff like that but uh the the belgian superpower that used to exist with uh you know Eric Gabors and Stefan Everts and things like that. It doesn't seem like those superpower Belgian riders are around very much anymore. And I think that there's some hope uh, from the Belgians, the Belgian fans, that Yago Geertz becomes that next superstar. Um, whether that happens or not, I'm not too sure. But he definitely looked really good this weekend, and it kind of showed some of some of the flashes that uh, I. Uh, felt like I could expect out of him um, my first not interaction I would say but like uh, noticing of Geertz was when I used to work at Verb uh, I would have to cover the EMX 150 class which was Honda's and Geertz was really good in that class too and that was five years ago now five six years ago so I've definitely seen Geertz kind of come through the ranks a little bit more so than other European riders, so I kind of know what he's capable of, and I think that um, what's been going on with him this year hasn't really, sh you know, shown his true potential. But maybe like Valandrin, maybe he just needed this, you know, good ride to kind of light a fire under him, if you will, and maybe, you know, the next race he comes out and just continues, you know, growing from that. Maybe he doesn't get on the podium again like he did in the second moto here. Uh, but maybe he becomes a consistent top five threat. It really seems like it's Red Bull KTM, Rockstar Husqvarna, and the rest in this series. Um, you know, it's Prado and Jonas out front. And then, although they're not third and fourth in the championship, it really seems like Thomas Covington and Thomas Kerr Olsen are like the next guys, if you will. And they were definitely such this weekend. They battled for second through fourth with Geertz getting mixed in there and Jonas and stuff like that uh, but Covington I believe went 2-3 uh, if I am not mistaken so he finished second overall and uh, he's been coming on strong man Covington looks really good I actually saw someone suggest that Covington might be a good pick 
for USA's Motocross the Nations team in 2019 because obviously he looked pretty good at Lommel, finishing second in the MX2 class and has probably more experience riding these deep, rough sand tracks in Europe than the American riders will. Uh, I think it kind of depends on how he does stateside next year, whether or not he's actually going to be a good pick for the MX2 spot. Um, there's a potential that Plessinger is still going to be in the class next year. I hope he's not, but we'll see. Anyway, Covington's look good, and Carrollston looks steady as usual. Um, <laughs> it's always got really just good, you know, consistent speed. Always seems to be a top five threat uh, all season long, and um, it's no different this past weekend in the MX2 class. So, yeah, I don't think I have much more to say about this past weekend. It was Lommel. It was crazy. I don't believe it was actually too hot there this weekend, but I don't know. Maybe somebody that went could tell me. I forgot the exact temperature readings that I saw, but um, looked like a, a pretty decent day in Belgium for a motocross race and. Golly, man, it's it's amazing watching those guys ride. Just any of them ride the sand. Hurlings exclusively, of course, but Cairoli, Fevra, Prado, Geyser, anybody. Those guys have incredible technique when it comes to riding the sand. Um, I only wish I had an ounce of their talent because it would be so fun to just know what it feels like to ride the way that those guys can in the sand. I mean, it... Honestly, like watching Hurlings ride through the sand, like it almost looks like he's kind of surfing on the sand or like gliding on it. Uh, it's it's wild, man. I, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it other than just say go try to find a video of him doing it. Uh, but yeah, MXGP of Belgium. Just a little update on where everything is. Uh, I think Hurlings' point lead is now out to about 30. I want to say 34, could be wrong, 33 or 34 I want to say, and Prado would now have his points lead out to about 12 or 12 to 15 somewhere in there over Jonas, and obviously it's grown leaps and bounds, Prado was pretty far back of Jonas six, seven races ago, caught him and passed him at Lockett a race ago, and now has a, a points lead that is, is growing, so it's going to be a Red Bull KTM sweep. I can guarantee that this year because if Prado and Hurlings both have major injuries, Jonas and Cairoli are far enough ahead behind, you know, Jonas and, or uh, Prado and Hurlings that if those guys went out, they're going to, you know, just hand the points lead over to Cairoli and Jonas and those guys will win the championship. I mean, it's a, it's a KTM super dominance in Europe right now. I'll tell you that much. Um, but yeah, points lead's getting a little bit bigger in the GPs. Hurlings has been on a roll since coming back from his broken collarbone. Um, something crazy, like he's won the last 12 GPs that he's raced and the last 20 out of 24 motos or something like that. I mean, he's crushing it. And pretty impressive stuff, that's for sure. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, please be sure to hit up the comment section below and let me know if I'm just an idiot and talking out of my tush on some of this stuff or if you uh, have anything that you'd like to add to the discussion about things I said or things I maybe didn't say that you think I should have. Uh, let me know in the comment section below. I will happily answer those. And yeah, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. So long for now.